Welcome students to lecture 12 of MHHS 1. Last time we talked about the overall argument of Cheryl Vint's essay, Promissory Futures, Medicine and Markets and Speculative Fiction, a chapter in the edited collection, South of the Future, Marketing Care and Speculating Life in South Asia and the Americas. The essay references several episodes of PBS's short film series, Future States. Last time, we touched on just one of them, um, the episode titled The Living, and today's lecture will be structured by three more episodes that I asked you to watch for today, Hollow, Refuge, and Crossover. So I had you watch these episodes uh, before class because they're relatively short and freely available on YouTube. And just like last time, I've, um, I've linked to the videos here in case you weren't able to find them. Um, along the way, uh, I, hope to, I hope you learn from these really compact examples of what is sometimes called a rich description. Now we've seen some, uh, examples of what, uh, what is sometimes called a close reading. Um, and recall that this just means the extraction of a specific passage to delve more deeply into its primary, secondary, tertiary, or whatever meanings. Um, so that's taking a small part of a larger text as the, as the object of interpretation. A rich description that we see in Vint's essay, however, zooms out past the local passage to encapsulate the text as a whole. So as you, as you may have noticed from Vint's essay, um, a rich description seems to have two goals. Number one, a pointed plot summary that goes beyond just a recap, and two, moments of deeper analysis that a casual reader or viewer might not catch the first time through. Um, so I hope you experience that as you're reading Vint's descriptions um, of, of, these, um, of these episodes. So as you learn from how Vint structures her own, uh, her own rich descriptions of these Future States episodes, uh, think about how you would compose your own. First up is Lisa Robinson's short film, Hollow, um, and that was in 2013. You'll find Vint's analysis of this short film on pages 79 to 81. Now remember that the thesis of this essay focuses on a cluster of three themes in all the analyzed texts, medicine, markets, and borders. And you can clearly see how this plot relies on this thematic cluster. Iris, a, custod uh, uh, Iris a, a custodial worker with a restricted immigrant card, finds herself in a precarious and vulnerable position, so she eventually decides to uh, submit herself to an experimental trial of a new kind of biotechnology called Neurolock. The new tech is supposed to offer hacker-proof data storage for clients that need the highest level of cybersecurity. Now, by storing this sensitive data in the participants' brains, the promise is that the data will never get in the wrong hands. Medical technology, ruthlessly driven by market demand, exploits those on the wrong side of the border. Medicine, markets, and borders, those three themes. Um, in this first episode, I want to highlight how a rich description might work. So you have seen the short film yourself by now, um, and you might think that you could just skip through the plot summary that Vint gives you in the essay. Um, however, a rich description that um, what we get from Vint actually goes beyond plot summary. And I'll just advise you here to read these rich descriptions carefully, um, even if you've watched the films yourself very carefully. So a rich description will make you think back to the text um, to reconsider aspects of it you may have missed the first time around. Um, so here is a concrete example from when Vint is describing Iris going through the neural lock procedure. Quote, as Iris undergoes the procedure, the cool blue tones of the clinical setting are intercut with warm greens and golds of her memories of Zana. The experience is overwritten by the data download. In the film's conclusion, we see that Iris survives the process mostly intact and continues to work as a neural lock courier, living in a slightly more upscale apartment but alone. So when you watched it, this scene moves quickly with fast cuts and impressionistic production. You may have had um, that sense of, uh, of the sterility of the clinical setting and the warmth of her memories with Zana, but Vint here provides a precise slow motion breakdown of the scene for you. 
This rich description allows you to see where your vague sense impressions came from um, and how the scene produced them. And uh, this is just another minor thing that you may have learned. Um, if you're not used to looking at furniture and square feet, you might not have even noticed that Iris is now in a, quote, slightly more upscale apartment, a visual cue that is actually very important to show that the Neurolog company actually did deliver on their promise of compensation. So after the rich description, Vint describes how this episode fits into her thesis about how SF can speculate about near future technologies by referencing the exploitative market practices of the present. The clear connection here is to pharmaceutical trials that just structurally find their, their, their pool of experimental subjects in the most precarious and vulnerable populations. In the present, however, pharmaceutical companies have plausible deniability. They can just say that it's really not up to them who ends up volunteering for these drug trials. So what the SF example of HALO does is to show the limits of that plausible deniability when those drug trials actually depend on and exploit um, the affective labor uh, uh, of people like Iris to make their billions. That affective laborer, Iris in this case, um, sacrifices her humanity, her vital energy for a meager benefit that is dwarfed by the profit margins of a biotech company like Neurolock. So here, it's clear that this sacrifice is not merely volunteering for a drug trial. Um, it's straight up coercion by making Iris choose the least bad path, even though it leads to utterly dehumanizing labor and loss. The second short film that I want to discuss is Mohammed Gorgistani's Refuge um, in 2013 as well. Let's situate this film within Vint's argumentative framework first. Recall that we're looking at medicine, markets, and borders. The medicine part of this is a genetics company called NuGene that is looking for, uh, for test surrogates to experiment on, um, on genetically modified fetuses. Reza, the new gene rep representative, makes the now familiar pitch for the common good. But what he's really offering is the promise of a green card for Sonia, whose position in the U.S. has been made precarious by the targeting of Iranian immigrants because of some vague health emergency. These prejudicially policed borders again create the market conditions for what seems like justified exploitation. Reza, after all, was also called to that scary meeting about Iranians' immigration status. And his pitch sounds, in a perverse way, kind of rational. The ending, like the one in Hollow, is a scene of biopolitical coercion in which Sonia is forced to sacrifice her body for what is called the public good. Everyone she interacts with is saying the same thing. They're just doing their jobs. And basically, this is just how the way, uh, this is just the way the world works. This is exactly what happens when Sonia gets told by the judge that um, her visa had been, uh, had been declined. With no explanation and no eye contact, the judge can only say that she is just reading what she has before her. Because of national security concerns, the judge's hands are just tied. In other words, she is just doing her job. So the ending of Refuge is slightly different from the one in Hollow. Um, Recall that um, in Hollow, we see Iris post-procedure in a slightly more upscale apartment. But in Refuge, Sonia's fate seems a bit more uncertain. The short film ends as Sonia is being taken into, uh, into implant the genetically modified fetus. We're not shown what happens afterwards. Um, we're left with questions. Did New Gene follow through on its promise? Will she still be deported? We're just left with all these uncertainties at the end. In Hollow, I think the point was to show us how frighteningly reasonable Iris's choice was. It seems utterly unthinkable to voluntarily undergo a procedure that could erase certain parts of your memory. But at the end of that film, Neurolock does fulfill its promise to Iris. And even though Zana has forgotten all about her, Iris has still managed to secure her position in the US. So, 
Even though the choice to volunteer for the Neurolock procedure might seem unthinkable, it ends up being strangely reasonable, strangely rational. So we don't even get that strange comfort in refuge. Instead, the last scene of Sonia walking into the implantation room is achingly contrasted with the previous scene. This is Vince's rich description of that moment. Quote, the scene immediately before this one, when Sonia came to her decision, was filled with sound and music as she watched children play in her neighborhood, a complex scene in which the vibrancy of their lives contrasts with the relative poverty of their surroundings. This visualization of close communal ties comments ironically on Sonia's need to instrumentalize something as intimate as carrying another life in her body. So um, unlike with the previous film, there is no promise kept here, only a critique of the xenophobic circumstances that led to Sonia's, quote, choice to undergo the new gene procedure. In contrast, to the vibrant communal and family connections she had fostered in the past, the idea of family in the sterile new gene compound had been distilled into the silent, creepy final scene in which Sonia submits to the experimental surrogacy. So what SF does here, Vint argues, is to amplify these contrasts, these inequities, and these contradictions of contemporary surrogacy and transplant culture. And finally, the third film we'll discuss today is Tina Mabry's Crossover um, 2012, which focuses on the market for transplanted organs. This film literalizes class divisions into a border between the chaotic, crime-ridden, unrestricted zone and the pristine, manicured utopia of the restricted zone. The school in the unrestricted zone is falling apart. It's dimly lit, and the students are just there for the free lunch. The school in the restricted zone is this gleaming building surrounded by beautiful green space. Again, we see immediately Vince cluster of, of those three themes, medicine, markets, and borders. We learn about this world largely through the expository news reports that we hear in the background of the film. So here is uh, Vince's rich description of one of those news reports. Quote, a caption tells us the year is 2028, and we hear a voiceover radio broadcast reporting the news that the Supreme Court has ruled that the new economically based separate but equal amendment has been deemed constitutional. Thus, segregation between restricted access and unrestricted schools will continue. In, um, in a pointed sequence, the, annou the announcer continues in. Related news, a 13-year-old boy was shot last night in the unrestricted part of LA, concluding that no charges have been brought um, against the homeowner who killed the boy. Um, so the first news report was about the legalization of class segregation in LA, that whole separate but equal thing. And the second one was about a boy who was shot dead by a homeowner. As the end of Vince's sentence indicates, she has, added, um, she has added emphasis to the word related there. So think for a minute, why would the reporter think that these two stories are related? Um, Vint is drawing our attention to that. For the reporter, the answer is probably just that the two sides, uh, the, the two stories were about the creation of these economic zones. But for us, the relatedness that we're supposed to see is that this would have never happened in the restricted zone. In the unrestricted zone, there seems to be some kind of stand your ground law that just blanketly allows for lethal force in case of trespassing, um, even if it is just a 13-year-old boy wandering onto your property. Um, so it's related news because the separate but equal thing is a complete lie. There are separate and unequal laws depending on which side of the border you're on. So a lot of these themes um, by now uh, should be very, very familiar. These characters, as Vint puts it, have been turned into mere, quote, spare parts, 
the market conditions have shaped a kind of dehumanized medicine that creates an asymmetrical system of triage for the sake of what it considers the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So what I find interesting about this film um, that really differenti differentiates it from the others is that it brings in neurodiversity as a site of marginalization and exploitation. Angela's son, Quincy, is revealed to be autistic after an assessment test, uh, which forces Angela to make um, really hard decisions about separating her mathematically gifted daughter, um, uh, Jennifer. Uh, so initially, she doesn't want to go through with it at all. But when Jennifer is caught by a stray bullet uh, through their window, Angela is forced to go through with, the, with that with the plan. Uh, Vint mentions that the separate but equal language is definitely meant to recall the educational segregation of the mid 20th century, um, and that's definitely there. But there's also the evocation, I think, of early 20th century immigration laws. At Ellis Island, for example, immigrants seeking a better life in the US were rejected for disability status for eugenic reasons. They refused entry in particular to what they called, quote, mental defectives, which would have included someone um, like Quincy, um, uh, the autistic child. Market-driven medicine, we see through this reference to immigration history, means that we only prioritize the most, quote, productive members of society. At Ellis Island, they were essentially asking, how could an autistic boy possibly contribute to GDP? Um, that was the implicit question. In all these episodes, SF seems to, to only slightly exaggerate our current conditions to expose the horrors of market-driven medicine. Vint contends throughout that SF is an effective genre to highlight the health inequities that market-driven medicine has produced. We may not notice it um, immediately right now as we live in this system, but just a little imaginative nudge from these SF stories can shake us out of our complacency and make us prepare for the social and political injustices of our near future.